And we're off. Okay, so. Perfect. All right, so here we go. So uh, today we're going to continue on with our look at uh, chapter two. But uh, now that we have the mean, we are ready to uh, move on to the next uh, aspect, which is variance and standard deviation. So much like we've seen with the rest of this course, we are now going to use the mean to calculate and understand what variance and standard deviation is all about. So if we keep building these skills, building these, uh, this foundation to understand more and more uh, complex uh, and intricate uh, things. So we're going to concentrate on variance and standard deviation. And let's take a look first at an example that illustrates one of the reasons why this is such an important uh, concept. So let's go back to the clinical example. Let's say that you are working in a clinic and you, uh, in this clinic, you treat two different types of depression, right? You have two different types of depression, so you have two different groups. And for group A and uh, group B, they have different uh, average levels. They have different mean levels of depression. So as measured by the Vex Depression Inventory, group A, your clients, uh, your patients, they have an average depression of 42.6. Group B, on the other hand, they have an average depression of 25.7. Right? So they actually have lower average depression. Now let's say that one of the things that uh, you need to do is you need to monitor these patients uh, and uh, make sure that the ones that are in danger of harming themselves get placed on suicide watch. Right? So you want to make sure that you have the resources to place these individuals on suicide watch if need be. The question becomes, if suicide is associated with higher levels of depression, if higher levels of depression cause suicide, which one of these groups would be more in danger of uh, being murdered by suicide? Which one of these groups would be more in danger of suicide? And if you look at the mean, you might say to yourself, well, group A has a higher mean depression. Higher depression leads to greater suicide risk. Group A would clearly have more people that need to be placed on suicide watch. However, it depends on the variability. It depends on how variable their level of depression is. Because if we take a look at the frequency distribution of their depression, if this axis here is increasing levels of depression, then in terms of the mean, there's group B right there at 25.7. And there's group A right there at 42.6. They have higher levels of depression. Let's say that this area right here, that's the danger area. That's where they are at high risk for suicide. That's where they need to be placed on suicide watch. You would imagine that more of the patients in group A would fall into this area. But if their frequency distribution looks like this, where all of them have pretty much the same level of depression, but the frequency distribution for group B looks like this, where the mean is lower, but they have a wide variety of levels of depression. You'll see from this that absolutely nobody in group A makes it into this risk area, but there are patients from group B, from the lower mean level of depression, that actually have higher overall depression, and that's because of their variability. The type of depression that group B has has more variable levels than the type of depression that group A has. And because of that, even though on average they're lower, there's more extreme cases because of that increase in variability. So that's what we're going to tackle today, the idea of variability. We're going to <clears throat> just introduce the general idea. We're going to see uh, what its importance is to the back half of this course, to inferential statistics, we're going to take a look at standard deviation and variance for a population. We're going to take a look at standard deviation and variance for samples. They are calculated differently, same idea, two different formulas. We'll have some in-class practice where we uh, go through the Excel sheet, and then I'll just mention the uh, homework assignment, and uh, hopefully we'll have some time left over for extra practice. Hopefully these issues didn't eat too much into that. All right, so the introduction to variability. So consider the following 
frequency distribution. And hopefully these are getting very easy for you to read, very straightforward. You see a frequency distribution pop up and you immediately know, all right, possible scores, apartment level, how many people are on each uh, score. So let's consider the following frequency distribution. It's a population that has a mean of mu, and the mean is right there, uh, the center of the distribution. So that's the measure of central tendency. What we're trying to do is we're trying to give a synopsis of this entire distribution here with this one representative score. So this distribution can be summarized by saying it has a mean of 100. And hopefully that will capture something about the, uh, the distribution. That will be a good representative score for the distribution. But notice that this mean of 100 is the representative score for this distribution. It's also the representative score for this distribution. And those are two very, very different distributions. So while the representative score does tell us where the center of that distribution is, it does not tell us how wide or how narrow that distribution is. It doesn't give us an important piece of information about how spread out our scores are. And that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at how spread out they are. We're looking at that measure of variability. So variability is another descriptive statistic. It's another number that you can report. And this produces a, gives you a quantitative number that you can use to describe the spread of your distribution, to describe how different are the scores in your particular distribution. And this is again a description of how spread out your scores are. If you have a high variability, then you have very spread out scores. If you have low variability, then you have very uniform scores, scores that are very close to each other. So this idea of variability is going to become very important when we look at inferential statistics, when we try to see if there's a difference between samples, when there's a difference between uh, two populations that we're looking at. And uh, that can be illustrated right here. So let's say that we have, we run an experiment and we have sample A over here and it comes from one population. And we got sample B over there and it comes from another population. Or alternatively, sample A is treated with one treatment, treatment A, sample B is treated with treatment B. We got two different samples from, two di from different situations. And we want to know, is there a difference between these two uh, samples? More importantly, is there a difference between these two populations? So the populations that these samples come from, are they different? Well, when we take a look at these samples here, they're pretty spread apart and it's pretty easy to say, just visually you take a look at them and it's pretty easy to say, yeah, those two samples, they really come from different situations. There's a real difference between those two samples. And as that moves closer together, as they get more and more close in terms of their mean, in terms of their measurable central tendency, it gets harder and harder to know if that difference between these two samples is actually a real difference. Because now here, even though there's a, very, there's a very small difference, notice how much overlap there is. So there are a lot of people in sample A that are scoring higher than people in sample B. There's a lot of people in sample B that are scoring lower than people in sample A. Not the case when they were more spread out. So it's very difficult at this point to say if there's a difference between these two samples. However, when we look at inferential statistics, we're going to take a look at the difference between the distance, the, uh, the size of the difference, and we're also going to take a look at and analyze the variability of these scores. Because whereas this has a ton of overlap, and this small little difference here would be hard to detect, it would be hard to detect that sample B, the treatment B, is better than treatment A, because there's a wide overlap, if the variability of these samples was smaller and smaller, notice that that same difference leads to very little overlap. So the importance of variability in inferential statistics is that inferential statistics takes both the difference between conditions into account and how variable are those conditions into account. 
to try to see if there's a real difference or is there just a chance fluke difference. So the more, the less variability you have, the easier it is to detect these smaller differences. All right, so that's the importance of variance. That's the underlying general idea. So now let's take a look at how uh, we build up this measure of variance. And we're going to start for uh, a population. So we're going to start with a population. We're going to start with the idea that we have a population and we have access to all of the scores. And the reason we're doing this, <clears throat> as I mentioned, earlier, we almost never have access to population data. It's very rare that you are able to go out and collect data from every single person that you're interested in. And if that was the requirement for psychology, psychology would be almost impossible to do. However, uh, we're going to start with a population, even though it's a rare occurrence that you're ever using population data, it is the easier one to introduce variability with, so that's why we're starting with it. So let's say that we have this frequency distribution here. We got a mean, uh, central tendency, mean for the population equals 100. And uh, the first thing that we're going to define, the first concept, is the idea of deviation. And deviation is just the distance of any score from the mean. So every single person living in this frequency distribution apartment building lives some distance from the center, and that distance is deviation. So this individual right there, they have a small positive deviation, small difference, right? They're bigger than the mean positive deviation, but it's a small positive deviation. This individual here has a small negative deviation. This individual down here has a large negative deviation. This individual over here has a large positive deviation. This individual over here has zero deviation. They live right at the mean. So it's the distance from the score to the mean. That's what a deviation is. So we can write it as the score minus the mean. Again, do not read this as x minus mu. x minus mu means nothing. But if you measure, if you read it as the scores minus the mean, you can very easily remember that deviation is your score minus the mean. If your deviation is negative, you're lower than the mean. If your deviation is positive, you're higher. And the larger the deviation, the further away from the mean you are. So hopefully you can see that deviation is really tied with variability. The more variability there are with the scores, the more large deviations there will be. So what we're in essence going to do is we're going to find out the average deviation. We're going to find out what sort of the average distance from all of these scores to the mean. The problem though is, is that we can't do that with just deviations. And the reason for that is because the mean is the central balance point for this frequency distribution, the negative deviations have the same size as the positive deviations, which means that whenever you add up all the deviations, you will always get zero. So adding up all the deviations and then dividing by the number of scores, that's not going to work because you will always end up with zero. It's a useless uh, move to try to do. So what can we do to get rid of these negative deviations? Well, what statisticians did was they squared them. They said, all right, let's square them. You square a positive number, you end up with a positive number. You square a negative number, you end up with a positive number. That's the way we'll change them all into positive numbers. So the next idea is squared deviations. And this is the distance from the mean squared. So it's the scores minus the mean. In parentheses, do that first. And then all of that is squared. So that's the idea of a squared deviation. And the only reason we're doing that is to get rid of the negative deviations. This makes every single score that we have, every single squared deviation, it makes it positive. Everybody with me so far? All right, next move. We're now gonna start to try to find the average deviation. First move we do, we saw this with uh, finding, calculating the mean. You add up everything. 
you sum everything, you sum these squared deviations. So this is the sum of the distance from the mean in parentheses, all squared. So this is the sum of the scores minus the mean and all of that in parentheses, do that first and then you square it. So remember your order of operations that's coming back here, very important to understand this. You take the deviations first, you square all the deviations, and then you sum up all of these deviations. Now this is an incredibly important concept. This is something that is used over and over again in statistics. And to just drive home how often this is used, the symbol for this is SS. The symbol for this is just sum of squares. So just imagine those poor grad students locked in that ivory tower, writing out all of these scores and calculating and doing all the statistics and getting that carpal tunnel syndrome and basically saying, you know what, we keep going sum of squared deviations. We keep running sum, we write this, sum of squared deviations. Let's just write SSD, right? Sum of squared deviations, that'll be great. And what they found was they kept going SSD, 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 and they kept using it so much that they kept getting carpal tunnel and they said, look, even SSD is not short enough, let's drop the D, we'll just call it SS, let's just call it sum of squares. That's how important this concept is. It's abbreviation got abbreviated because it got used so often. So that's great for the grad students. They were able to save their wrists. A little tricky for us because this concept will fool your mind or try to fool your mind into thinking it's something that it's not. And that's because the sum of squares, you have to be very careful, is not the sum of squares. It's the sum of squared deviation. So if I just walked up to you last class and I said to you, what do you think the sum of squares is? You would say, oh, well, you, you square the scores and you sum them. That's the sum of the squares. That's not what SS is. So my recommendation to you is even though it's just SS, number one, never read it as SS. Number two, never read it as sum of squares. Read this as sum of squared deviations whenever you come across it. And if in your book you see it written out as sum of squares, and they're talking about this formula here, read it out as sum of square deviations, get into that habit, because not only is it tricky when you're reading about it, it's also tricky in Excel, and I'll show you that when we get to Excel. All right, so we take the squares, uh, sum of, uh, the square deviations, and we sum it all up. And uh, just as a kind of brief little aside here, I'll mention that um, back for those um, for those uh, graduate students locking their towers doing this by hand, they have a definitional formula for sum of squared deviations, where it's the sum of the deviation squared. But they also have a computational formula that you'll see in your text. And the computational formula is mathematically equivalent, but it's easier to do by hand. So this is the formula that you will use if you ever need to do statistics and you're uh, stranded on a desert island. But uh, we're going to be using Excel, so you don't have to worry about it. But I just wanted to point it out in case you're wondering, what's the second equation? It's just easier to do by hand. If you're ever stuck on that island, try to remember that formula. But we're going to use Excel, so we don't even have to worry about uh, these computational formulas. All right. Finally, we've summed up the squared deviations. The last thing we're going to do now is we're going to divide by the number of squared deviations. We're going to divide by the size of our population, and that's going to give us population variance. So population variance is the mean squared deviation. And the way that we get to that is we take our sum of squared deviations and we divide them by the number of scores. So here is your formula for population variance. Sum of squared deviations divided by the size of your sample, and the symbol for that is sigma squared. All right, so the, uh, the uh, symbol for that is sigma squared. Read that as population variance. It's a Greek symbol, stands for population stuff. So that's population variance, read it as population uh, variance. 
So now we have a number that gives us the average squared deviation. But this is a little bit of a weird thing to ask for because we didn't want the average squared deviation. We wanted the average deviation. It would be like if you were uh, rocking a 4.0 GPA and a friend of yours says, hey, what's your GPA? And you tell them, well, my GPA squared is 16. They're like, well, I don't want your GPA squared. I want the G, just give me, just tell me it's four. So here we have the average squared deviation. It's not exactly what we want. So the last move we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate the standard deviation, which is right there, which is just completing, the, uh, undoing the squaring by taking the square root. So you have the variance, your sum of squared deviations divided by the size of your sample. You just take the square root of that, square root of sigma squared, and no surprise, you end up with sigma. So sigma is standard deviation, population standard deviation. Sigma squared is population variance, and those are the two standard measures for how spread out are your scores in a population. All right, any questions on that so far? Makes sense how we got to that kind of final calculation? All right. So now we found the spread for a population. We found how to calculate the variance for a population, some of the square deviations divided by the size of your sample. There's your variance. We found how to calculate the standard deviation of a population. You take your variance and you take the square root and you end up with the... Um, standard deviation. Now we're going to take a look at how to do this for samples. And it's, it needs to be corrected. It needs to be changed a little bit so that it works for samples. And the reason for this is because samples, they tend, just because of the way that our universe works, just because of the way that numbers work, they tend to be less variable than your population. So when you take people out of a population, those people that you selected, they just tend to be less variable than the entire population as a whole. So this kind of makes intuitive sense, but let's drive it home with a kind of visual representation of it. Let's say that this is your sample, oh, sorry, that's your population right there. That's everybody that you're interested in, right? That's the entire population of individuals that you want to know psychology stuff about. There's the mean, and there's no way that we can test everybody in a population. So let's say that we grab five subjects from our population, and those are the five subjects. They're the deviations from that mean for those five subjects. Just visually, you can see that the variability of those five subjects is lower than the variability of the population. Because if you take the limits of the population's variability, Right? If you go edge to edge on that population, it will always be smaller than the edge to edge on your sample. So your sample is always going to be less diverse than your population. Your sample is always going to be less variable than your population. And really, the only way that it would ever be as variable as your population is if you just happened to get that lowest scoring individual on this side, and you just happened to pick the highest scoring individual on this side. And what are the odds of that when you're talking about a population of seven billion people? You got a one in seven billion chance on the one end, you got a one in seven billion chance on the other end, probably not gonna happen. So, samples tend to be less variable than our populations. That's a problem because we wanna estimate the population variance. We wanna know stuff about the population. We're less interested in stuff about the sample we're using the sample as our gateway to get to know stuff about the population. So if the sample is less variable than the population, and we're using our sample to estimate the variability of a population, then we have a problem. So what we need to do is we need to adjust this uh, sample variance somehow. We need to adjust it so it becomes an accurate estimator for population variance. So this idea is nothing new. This is idea is something that all of us have probably done before, um, especially uh, because I think all of us probably have that one friend that just cannot estimate how long it's going to take them to get ready 
And if you don't have that one friend, you're probably the one friend that can't estimate how long it's going to take. But we know how to handle this individual. So we know if we're going out somewhere and we tell them, you know what, I'll come by to pick you up. Uh, when are you going to be ready? We know that phone call is useful because even though they tell us 20 minutes, we know that it's not 20 minutes, but we know that 20 minutes actually means 30 minutes. So if they say, oh yeah, I'm going to be ready, just give me 20 minutes, you say, all right, sure, see you then, and then you show up 30 minutes later. And if they tell you, you know what, I'm going to need an hour, I just woke up, I need an hour to get ready, you tell them, okay, yeah, no problem, see you in an hour, but you show up in 90 minutes. Right? And if they're like, oh yeah, I'm almost out the door, it's 10 minutes, you're like, okay, yeah, no problem. And you show up 15 minutes later. So it's not a waste of time to call this person and see how long they're going to take. It's just that you need to correct it so that it's the actual truth. Same thing with samples. The sample gives you information, but we need to correct it so it's actually the truth of what's going on in the population. So this is the first time where that difference between samples and populations becomes very important because this is the first time where the sample needs to be treated differently so that it predicts or estimates correctly that population. All right, so let's see how we do this. We still got the concept of deviation. That stays the same. So now we have the distance for each sample score from the mean. So now we're dealing just with the sample but we can calculate the mean of a sample, and then we find the deviation of each score from that mean. So we have the score minus the sample mean, that gives us the deviation for each score. We also can then square the deviations. We have to do this once more. Because the mean completely balances out the sample, the two sides of them will cancel out if we just add them together. So once again, we take the square deviation, the distance, uh, from the mean squared, so the score minus the sample mean, in parentheses, all of that squared, gives us squared deviations. Once again, we pull the move of summing those up. So we have the sum of the squared deviations, the sum of the distances from the mean squared, uh, and this is so far exactly like we did for a population, and that's why the symbol, again, is the same. It's SS. One more time, this is often read as sum of squares. Do not do that, it is sum of squared deviations because you do not want to, you don't want program, you do not want to program into your mind this error here where you think the sum of squares is actually the sum of squares. It's the sum of squared deviations. Drive that into your mind, read SS as the sum of squared deviations. It's this, not this. All right, so then we got the sum of squares. Once again, we got the definitional formula and the computational formula. That's your desert island formula, but we're gonna be using Excel and we're gonna see that in about two minutes. So we have our sum of squares. Now we're ready to calculate our sample variance. And what we do is we find the mean squared deviation, just like we did before, with one little adjustment, and that adjustment is this little minus one. So remember I told you we live in a universe that loves minus one. Minus one pops up again and again in the universe we live in. Here it is one more time. So this is the sum of the squares divided by the size of your sample, sum of the squared deviations, divided by the size of your sample minus one. And that is your sample variance. So let's take a look at what this does. Let's say that we have a sum of squared deviation and it equals 90. And we have a sample size and it equals 10. If we calculated our variance using the population formula, we would go 90 divided by 10, we would end up with a variance of nine. That's too low. That's underestimating it, that's not enough. What we do instead, is we say, all right, we're going to take 90 and we're going to divide it by 10 minus 1, right? We got that minus 1 right there. That becomes 90 divided by 9. So instead of a variance of 9, we've corrected it now to a variance of 10. That's the correct estimate for our population variance. That's why we got that minus 1. That is sample variance. 
And then uh, also we have sample standard deviation. Same move, we have our sample variance. We just take it and we divide, I'm uh, sorry, we take the square root of it. So it is the square root of the sample variance uh, and it is S for population standard deviation. All right, so that is the background to uh, what we are gonna be calculating now in Excel. So that gives you the uh, peek behind the curtain in terms of what it is that we're gonna be doing. So uh, if you haven't already, open up the uh, uh, week three, uh, class two, practice chapter two, variance and standard de uh, deviation uh, Excel sheet. We are now gonna go through those to learn the formulas that we can use to calculate these so that we can save our uh, risks and uh, not get the same affliction that those poor, there we go, that those poor uh, graduate students did. Okay, so we have six examples and what I'm gonna do is uh, we're gonna go through uh, one example here and then we'll turn the rest of them over to uh, practice time where you can practice some of your copy and pasting and all of that uh, good stuff as well. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, in class right now, uh, learn how to calculate sum of square deviations. We're going to learn how to calculate sample variance and we're going to learn how to calculate sample standard deviation. I'm also going to show you population variance and population standard deviation because that's going to be uh, necessary for your homework. All right, so um, your homework starts off with population variance and population standard deviation. That's not the correct way to do it. That's one of the differences I have between uh, the textbook and, and the way that I think it should be taught. So we're going to teach it the right way first, which is using sample variance and sample standard deviation. But let's, uh, let's head on off and uh, know more about that. All right, so we have three sets of scores. We have our X scores here. We have our Y scores here and we have our Z scores right down here. And we want to calculate the sum of square deviations. We want to calculate the population, sorry, sample variance. And we want to calculate sample standard deviation. So let's start doing some, uh, using some equations. So first I will show you the wrong equation just so you don't fall into this trap. So if you were calling this sum of squares, and you were reading SS as sum of squares. And every single time you saw it, you're like sum of squares, sum of squares, sum of squares. You would then have programmed your mind for this next little error, which is to go into Excel and say equals sum SQ, right? Sum of squares. And then you take a look at this sum SQ and you're like, well, what does this do? And you read it and it goes, oh, returns the sum of squares of the arguments. That's exactly what I want. I want sum of squares. Here's sum of squares. That's not sum of squares. Sorry, that is sum of squares. It's not sum of squared deviations. So don't fall for that, all right? Don't fall into this trap. Don't program your mind to make yourself susceptible to this. It's sum of squared deviations. So the correct formula we're looking for is DEVSQ. And this returns the sum of squares of deviations of data points that's the one that we want. So don't fall for the sum SQ. You want DEV SQ. Open up those parentheses. We highlight the uh, scores that we want the sum of square deviations to be calculated for. Close those parentheses, hit enter, and you should end up with a massive number. So don't be afraid if it's in the 10,000s. That's depending upon how many scores you have, it gets very large very quickly. So let's pop that answer up into our answer cells using the equals function. And we see that we have that one correct. And as I mentioned last time, if you get this hashtag, hashtag, hashtag uh, message from Excel, that means that your number is there. And you can see down here, we got it correct. So it means that your number is there. It's just that Excel can't um, can't display it. So you can always go to the column, move it to the edge until you get that little double arrow, and then just make it as wide as you like, and you can see the answer uh, right there. 
All right, so we have the sum of squared deviation. So let's do that for the y scores as well. So once again, equals DEVSQ, sum of the squares of deviations, open parentheses, highlight your cells, highlight your scores, close those parentheses, hit enter, and we have uh, almost twice, uh, or over twice as large sum of squared deviations for the y scores. And then finally, one more time equals DEVSQ, open parentheses, highlight those uh, scores for the Z scores, close your parentheses, hit enter, and we see that we have an absolutely huge sum of square deviations for the Z scores. And we get that little hashtag message, but we can see our number is still there. All right, so everybody calculated, got those numbers, looking good so far? All right. So the next one here, we're doing um, the variance. Now, before we do the correct variance, before we do sample variance, I'm gonna show you population variance. Write down this equation, you're gonna need it for your homework. But the way that uh, we're gonna do it is equals var, that tells SPSS that you wanna, uh, you want it to calculate variance. Then you need to tell it what kind of variance. So what we want to do is we want to use this dot P. That P is for population. This literally tells Excel, calculate the variance for the population. Use the population formula. So if you need to use the population formula, like you're going to do in your homework, this is the one you want to use. You want to use var dot P, and then you can highlight the cells. It works exactly the same way as the other formulas. But notice, that it's not correct for the sample variance, right? Notice we didn't get it correct because sample variance is corrected. It's got that different formula. So once again, for your homework, you're going to want to use equal var dot p. Dot p is for uh, population. When we're using a sample, when we're doing a sample variance, you got two options. You got var dot s means variance for a sample calculate that sample variance but just to show you how often you calculate the variance of samples if you go back to the original kind of versions of Excel formulas and you just use var with no designator notice it goes uh, estimates variance based on a sample so var alone which is the one that we'll use in this class VAR alone calculates the variance for a sample. That's how often you calculate the variance for a sample, that the default variance formula is for a sample. So we're going to use equals VAR, and then we're going to open up that parentheses, highlight those, uh, highlight the scores that we want to calculate the variance for, sample variance. We hit enter, and we see that we have the sample variance uh, right there. So we got that correct, so let's do it one more time. Equals var, that's for sample variance. Open parentheses, highlight those scores, close your parentheses, and we have the variance for y. Pop that into our answer cell using the equals function. We got that correct. And then finally, equals var, and you can use dot s if you like, but var is backwards compatible on more versions of Excel. So sample variance, highlight the scores, close those parentheses, hit enter, pop it into um, the answer cell there, and we got that one correct. So before we carry on, notice that we now have a measure of the sample variability for X, Y, and the Z scores, and we can see that the X scores have a lower variability, they have 935, compared to the Y scores, which have higher variability, uh, 2,300, and Z scores are very highly variable at 5,700. So what this means is that the X scores are not very spread out at all, the Y scores are more spread out, and the Z scores are absolutely massively spread out. And you can see that where in the X scores here, the smallest score is a five, the largest one is 91. But in the Z scores, the smallest score is a four, but it goes as high as 263. So you can see that it has captured 
that uh, idea of the z-scores being more spread out. All right, last one, we want to calculate the sample standard deviation. And uh, sometimes I see students take the square root of the sample variance. You can do that. You can kind of do these step by step like, they, uh, like you would do if you were calculating it by hand. But I always like the formula to use it. So uh, equals uh, STDEV for standard deviation. It works just like the variance. If you want a population, put that dot P in there. That'll give you the population standard deviation. If you just want it for a sample, once again, notice that the default STDEV with no signifier calculates that sample standard deviation once again, a nice indication of how often you will be using sample standard deviation. So equals STDEV, we highlight those, uh, those scores, to, uh, hit, uh, close the parentheses, hit enter, pop that into our answer cell, and we can see that we got that correct. And you can see the relationship here between the variance and the standard deviation. Your variance is 935. You take the square root of that, you get 30.6. It's they're completely related by that squared square root um, relationship. So let's finish this off uh, for the y scores equals STDEV. Open parentheses, highlight those scores, close those parentheses, pop it into your answer cell using the equals function, and you got that correct. And then finally equals STDEV, open those uh, parentheses, highlight the z-scores, close up the parentheses, hit equal, uh, hit enter, and then pop that in using the equals function, and you see that we got those correct as well. So any questions on that? Any, everybody's got the formulas either written down or in your Excel sheet? All right. So we have uh, other questions here on this, uh, on this practice sheet. We have questions with different numbers of scores uh, in the samples. And you'll notice that here in these practice sheets, they're all sample variance and sample standard deviation. So um, I would highly recommend, make sure that you do, uh, you know, do this practice, get very um, proficient at this, because again, we wanna get to the point where you can take a look at a question like this and go, all right, equals DEVSQ, open parentheses, let's highlight those, equals VAR, open parentheses, let's highlight those, equals STDEV, open parentheses, there we go, copy and paste, equals, pop that answer cell in, copy and paste, copy and paste, you want to get to that point, right? That's kind of like the, the, the speed at which you want to be able to do this. The closer you can get to that, the more time you'll have on the exam to sit there and consider each question and take your time and not feel any time pressure and be able to think through each of your questions. So do put in the practice. It's highly worth it to make sure that you can get to that, uh, get to that stage, uh, get to that sort of efficiency and uh, basically... Um, yeah, basically just get to that point. All right, so we're going to turn it over to uh, practice in just a moment. I just want to mention uh, a few things just to make sure that everybody is on the same page. All right, so that was the in-class uh, practice. And uh, just to sort of uh, make it official, um, just a reminder that the, uh, you know, use that quiz me option uh, for the study plan. I will be updating grades uh, either on Friday or Monday in Canvas so that you get a more accurate look at uh, exactly what your grades, is, what your grades are. Um, I will correct anybody who has completed uh, the study plan by then. I will correct your, um, your pre-tests at that point. But uh, just so that everybody's aware, the final deadline to earn your mastery points for these pre-tests that we've done for chapter one and chapter two, that is uh, the day before the exam by midnight. 
So I will, anybody that's already done them, when I update the grades, uh, I will update your, your pretest points to match your study plan uh, points if that's, uh, you know, if you maximize your study plan points. Just kind of so you can see how it works. But if you haven't done your study plan points yet, if you haven't earned those yet, just know that they will be due, the last opportunity will be the midnight before the day of the exam. All right, and just to uh, uh, remind you, there is extra practice uh, available as well. So there's another Excel sheet where you can uh, practice your sum of square deviation uh, formulas, your variance, your standard deviation. And again, a lot of this is just repetition. So I didn't see anybody with looks of confusion when I was doing these, uh, when I was doing these formulas. So I know you know how to use them. But the quicker it becomes, the more efficient it becomes, the more automatic it becomes, the more straightforward everything else is uh, when we get to the more complex chains of statistics that we'll be doing. Uh, just a reminder that uh, you are now ready to go on homework uh, number four, chapter two, part two. So part one was all about the mean and central tendency. Part two is now all about variance and um, standard deviation. Uh, part three is going to be about z-scores. We're almost there, you kind of have the pieces, but uh, unless you're really feeling frisky, uh, I would say hold off on working ahead on those z-scores because that is one of the first kind of common hurdles that some students trip up on. So um, I love it if uh, you, know, you feel confident enough to work ahead, but just know that z-scores tend to be challenging, so don't worry if it doesn't make sense right off the bat. And then uh, the last thing about homework assignment four is that for the homework, you need to use population variance and population standard deviation. So the book teaches you kind of incorrectly first and then corrects it later on. I don't like learning something wrong at the beginning because it's harder to unlearn something than to learn it the first time. However, I am not able to go in and modify the, uh, the sort of formulas and algorithms that are used to generate questions in the homework. So because of that, I just want to warn you, use population variance and population uh, standard deviation for your homework section. Uh, and what that means is that when you do it in Excel, all you need to do is for the VAR formula for variance, just add that dot P. And for the STDEV formula for standard deviation, just add the dot P. That'll calculate population variance, population standard deviation respectively, and uh, you'll be able to practice your Excel while earning points for your homework. All right, so that is uh, it for today. So uh, we still got, miraculously, 15 minutes left uh, for practice time today. So if you want to start on that practice, finish those Excel sheets, if you want to um, start up on your homework, uh, you know, feel free, if you have any issues, call me over. And if you want to call it an early day, feel free as well, uh, if you're all stacked out. But uh, if you do need any assistance, absolutely make sure you call me over. But uh, that is what I wanted to cover for today.